So I read your book, yes. um, <laughs> and uh, it's quite an extraordinary story. So I'm Thank really you. pleased to actually get to meet you now and maybe ask you some questions and probe a little bit into sort of what it is you're perceiving and then maybe try to think about what could be happening in your brain and what could be explaining some of these phenomena that you're experiencing. So, right. so to start off, what are you experiencing right now? Are you seeing me as a fractal image? Are you yeah, the lights? It's definitely How is it? movement based. Like uh, when something moves, it doesn't look smooth or continuous. Or, I'm sorry, it doesn't look smooth anymore. It looks like a discrete uh, image coming in with little filaments connecting. It's like, imagine watching a television and you're hitting pause repeatedly and you're seeing frame by frame by frame only in real time. That's, that's the hardcore basis of what it, it looks like. And with these filaments connecting the frames. And what's so amazing is that the slope of the line connecting the frame, you can define its velocity and acceleration and all sorts of beautiful things from it. N not to mention just the pure beauty of it. Like lights to me uh, are, look like pi, at least the center of pi with the burst coming out. But of course, since they're not going through water, they're bouncing off at all sorts of different angles. So when you say it looks like pi, what do you mean exactly? So pi is sort of, you know, this, this formula. The number pi, right. yeah, okay, the so shape of pi. Um, I, I don't know if we have a drawing of it, but uh, it, it forms a ring, basically uh, that's very similar to the double rainbow. When you see the double rainbow, you're actually seeing the geometry of the number pi. So just to start off, I'm gonna to try to map out sort of what you're saying in terms of what you're perceiving onto what I understand about the brain and how it works. So, so far in terms of your visual imagery, it sounds like there's a part of your brain that's involved with um, perceiving visual motion. There's an area of the brain called V5. And if you have um, some damage to that area, things could look sort of staccato. And that could explain, and there's a lot of, there not, not a lot, but there are a few people who have this, this problem where they have some sort of lesion to that part of the visual cortex, and the world kind of is going in this sort of almost like still frame movie. Exactly. So that's one aspect of what you're experiencing. Um, but when you initially had this trauma, this, these blows to the head, you had an MRI, or you, might, you had an MRI years later? But it was years later, yes. They didn't find any damage no. sort of on the macro level when they looked with, with just structural MRI. No, yeah, they tested, I have these uncontrolled muscle movements and some other things that have come with it and they tested me for ALS, uh, MS, and eventually just diagnosed me with something called benign muscle fasciculations, which is just basically your muscles move by themselves, but it's not gonna kill you. Just make you answer your leg a lot when you think your phone is ringing, but it's really just your muscles vibrating. I've actually had that phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> I've answered Phantom my leg phone. probably 300 times. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, um, so we know from neuroimaging, actually some work that we're doing in our lab, that some people with traumatic brain injury, mild traumatic brain injury, where there's no sort of clear lesion in the brain upon doing a first anatomical MRI scan, but they still complain of a lot of symptoms, and using finer imaging techniques, things like DTI, where you can look at the white matter connectivity, um, you can actually see some problems there which aren't necessarily seen when you do the classic MRI that most people get when, as soon as they have a blow to the head, they go to the hospital, they get this, if they don't see any damage, they're sort of sent home. Mm -hmm. um, but they can experience a lot of other symptoms, and what we're finding is that there's the shearing effect where the white matter can be affected and can explain some of the problems they're having. But what's unique about your case, and although you have had experienced a lot of difficulties with yes. this. It's not all good, right? Yes, I mean, it's not all good. There's been a lot. It's been a lot of hardship at first, especially, as I've been working through it. Yeah, so in general, most people have sort of problems after they've had injury, but you found something extraordinary as well after right. this. Right. I mean, the good far outweighs the bad, but there, um, at first, um, right after this happened, um, I experienced at least several years of post-traumatic stress where I, I basically didn't leave my house for three years. I had blankets over the windows, no light came in whatsoever. Um, it was because when I was attacked, uh, there was a lot of people there and they watched and I, and I called for help several times and not one, one guy actually put his hands up like this, turned around and walked away right in the middle of it and, and nobody else did anything. And so it was like this, you feel safe in public and, and then suddenly this happens and you realize, you know, maybe you're not so safe. And, and uh, so I basically holed up in my house and, and developed OCD also at the same time. Uh, never cared about germs before, but suddenly I was literally spraying Lysol on my money and putting it in the microwave <laughs> for 30 seconds to make sure there was no germs left on that dollar bill before I went and spent it. 
Yeah. Uh, so, and it got to pretty high extremes, you know, until eventually I went to get help for it. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, not, not uncommon for people to develop things like OCD or depression after head trauma. And it's both the psychological aspect of it, of having this really traumatic experience, um, but combined with the actual physical you know, lesions in the brain, if they're there, these micro lesions perhaps in the white matter connectivity as I was talking about, um, which can cause a, very, a variety of problems. And, but in your case, it was very severe. You didn't leave the house, I mean, barely left the house for a number of years. But then you became really sort of not just obsessive compulsive about contamination, yes. but also um, really obsessive compulsive about mathematics. Yeah, or, it's, and it's like the geometry of the math. Yeah. It, it, since everything looks different, I just started seeing patterns within everything. Um, like if something would move and it would accelerate, and I took those two frames and I compared them, the distance between the second frame, like say you went two miles an hour here and you went four miles an hour here, this frame was longer, and if I compared the two, the distance between them was the acceleration. And uh, you, could, you could define things by it. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, every time I saw the rainbow, I would see pi. Uh, and I just became obsessed with, with pi, uh, geometry, fractals I see everywhere and can, and can draw fractals, but at the time I didn't know what they were. Um, and then prime numbers. Um, there's, I found a, it's not really a pattern to prime numbers, it's a geometric pattern to prime numbers uh, that prime numbers will fall on to infinity. Prime numbers and prime numbers, uh, any prime multiple and primes any exponent. So there is this weird geometric pattern to primes. Um, so we can predict the vector that they'll fall on, but so far I can't predict if it's going to be a prime. I can only say if it's on this vector, it's either a prime, a prime to any power, or a prime times a prime. And when I say prime, I mean prime 7 and above. 2, 3, and 5, they call those the base primes. Uh, I consider them what I call the primes of symmetry, um, where you can divide them evenly into a circle or into pi, whereas all other primes, you can't. So. Fascinating, <laughs> but, but, but um, just to take it back a notch, we, when you first um, had this head trauma, you were just having visual kind of sensations, seeing these yes. fractal images everywhere. You couldn't describe it in the way that, it wasn't that you got hit in the head, woke up one day and could right. talk lyrically about mathematics and the way everything's sort of inter, in, integrated, right? You had a visual experience. Yeah. And, and then you became fascinated by that mm -hmm. and understanding you know, what that involves and then started investigating and, and sort of doing research about mathematics. Right, as I, and I, I, would, I was slowly started like trying to draw uh, what I was seeing, yeah, but I didn't use a ruler and it was real sloppy. Mm -hmm. And I had a friend say, you know, why don't you use a ruler and try to make that look neat? And so I drew it and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I'm talking about. And, and, I, and just to be able to draw it for me was amazing because we played Pictionary as a kid and I was the worst at it. Yeah, we'd always win because we would cheat. So, <laughs> but uh, it, it was beautiful and I found that once I drew it, I was able to explain it to people uh, and easily anybody could understand it when I showed them a series of pictures. You know, fifth and sixth graders w could understand pi if I drew it at three different values mm -hmm. uh, and then showed them these three pictures at the same time and explained how it worked. And of course, but at, at first, I wasn't saying it like that. I was just mm -hmm. basically saying, everything's pieces of pi. I would see all these angles, and I would notice pi drawn at this, free, that this with this many sides had an angle of, of this, and it drawn this way would give me this angle. And as I was seeing things move, these streaks would make similar uh, shapes that mm -hmm. would all break down at pi drawn at some sort of value. And, uh, so, I mean, so far, I'm trying to think of it, again, from my lens of, you know, from a neurological perspective. And, it, and we know that the way the visual cortex is organized, um, there's these sort of different columns, and, and each one is sensitive to a different kind of line orientation. Okay. Um, and so that's why actually some people who have these near-death experiences or where they lose oxygen to the, and the visual cortex, the way in which you lose oxygen, it actually gives you this, this sort of um, illusion of tunnel vision because the way the columns are organized in terms of um, visual imagery of these angles. So if your visual cortex is affected in some way, it, it's not that far-fetched to say that you might start seeing the world um, in these kinds of patterns. Mm -hmm based on how our visual cortex is organized. So I, from what I gather so far is that you, you, you had some sort of head trauma, we can't say exactly what it was, but that it caused you to have these, these visual 
illusions, however you want to call them, or you know, perceptions mm -hmm. um, that were fascinating to you, and then you started investigating things like it discovered pi, and then it all seemed to be really interrelated. Um, then started doing these drawings, which you do with a, a, a compass and ruler, and it's it's very you know precise and right. and then how they're you know you're you're you started discovering how they're interrelated with mathematics and geometry and the rest right. of it. So I just want to make that clear because it's I think. Some people could you get the impression that all you know we all have this extreme math ability, and right. you can just get hit in the head, and one day you know you you. Right. And I, and I don't think it's quite like that. It's I, not. Yeah. It wasn't. I was saying it in layman terms for for several years. Yeah. And it, to where I I mean I I would I sent it. I remember sending pictures of pi mm -hmm. to universities and saying here's here's pi, and I was expecting them to say yes, this is it, and let me tell you how it works. And the response I got was just what. <laughs> and, and, and then I was like, hmm, you know, what if I'm crazy and I just don't know it? And uh, so I eventually, uh, a physicist, mm -hmm. I was at, went to the mall finally at one point and I ate at Subway Sandwich and I was drawing. Mm -hmm. And he came over and talked to me and he said, this really looks mathematically based. You know, what classes have you taken? And I said, well, I've had pre-algebra, but, you know, that was it. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it was, it was interesting. And he begged me, he said, please, just go enroll in algebra and see if you like it. And I, I went to Tacoma Community College, and I enrolled, and the very first day they graphed an equation. And I, I, I looked at the teacher, and I said, so you're telling me that every one of these equations is describing geometry? And she said, yes, of course. And I'm like, well, I'm speaking geometry, and you're speaking equation, which is describing geometry. So we're talking about the same thing, just in two different ways. Mm -hmm. It's just that geometry is the naturally occurring form of math. Like, for instance, x squared makes this little parabola, but the parabola is what's real, not x squared. So the, the universe and everything in it is just naturally occurring geometric forms of equations, and we use these numbers to describe it. Of course, the geometry shows that it could be correct, whereas the equations, you can actually prove it. And that was what going to school did for me, was enable me to finally start gaining some of the tools to, to prove that that was pi at a certain value and to write the equation to match it. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the things that's extraordinary about your case, or what, which is insightful, is that with certain types of, of head trauma, um, it, it, and you're not the only case. There are other people who develop what's called acquired sort of, they call it savant skills or even acquired synesthesia, which seems to be what you have, um, that how this works in the brain, there's a couple of different theories. One idea is that something, there, there's, first of all, there's implicit learning. We're all learning um, outside of awareness all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and we have sort of certain parts of our brain, particularly in prefrontal cortex, that could be suppressing certain things because we can't be consciously aware of everything all the time. Now, there are some studies which show that people who have these acquired skills, whether they're usually, they usually tend to be in the realm of like artistic ability or musical ability, in your, ca in your case, mathematical ability. Um, and one idea is that a lot of these people had damage to the left hemisphere, which somehow the theory is that it releases these abilities that you've had, that you were learning implicitly perhaps um, in the right hemisphere and allows sort of the right hemisphere skills or processes to kind of dominate, whereas usually the left hemisphere is, is dominant. That's one theory. Um, but in your case, actually, you did some imaging work, right? There was a... Yeah, a, they did functional MRIs mm -hmm. in Finland. Right. And that, but they found that actually you had more activation in the left hemisphere when you were um, solving these mathematical, oh, you were drawing these mathematical they equations. They put me in there and they would flash images and then an equation would pop up and mm -hmm. they would see uh, what area of the brain started to activate. Yeah, and so that is actually then counterintuitive to the theory that damage to the left hemisphere is what's causing this sort of, you know, more processing occurring in the right hemisphere because when you're seeing these equations, you're actually getting more left hemisphere activation. So that couldn't quite explain what you were doing. There's other, um, there's someone named Alan Snyder in um, Australia, who does some work with healthy people, where he has them solving certain equations, and they learn a rule implicitly over time. Right. Um, and then he kind of switches up the rule, and people are very, have, and once they learn the rule implicitly, they have a hard time kind of uh, overcoming that to try to develop a new strategy, or some might call this creativity. But then what he does is he uses something called transcranial magnetic stimulation, mm -hmm. where you can use a magnet and kind of stimulate but actually knock out a part of brain. Um, and in that sense, he just, and, you know, just temporarily. Um, 
and he did it for the, I believe it was the left uh, frontal temporal lobe. And when he would do this, they would um, all of a sudden be able to solve the, the problem, so use a different strategy to be more flexible in their strategies. So a lot of times we have this sort of dominant, some might call it left hemisphere, that is going to block us from thinking outside the box or thinking creatively, but when you release that, then you can, which is counterintuitive because you would think if you, you know, damage a part of the brain or, or you know, inhibit it that it would cause a problem, but in some cases it can release you to become, to think outside the box, so to speak. Wow. So that's sort of, and not really knowing where the actual lesion is in your head, it's hard to say. You know, so I'm trying to kind of think about what you're describing and how we could perhaps think about it in terms of neurally. But it seems that you also spent a lot of time, you were an extrovert before. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. In fact, I, mean, I was a goof before, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much spent my life uh, going to bars, singing karaoke, chasing girls, and cheating in school, probably. <laughs> right. <laughs> I bit graduated with the exact number of credits I needed to mm -hmm. graduate. But, but then you, you suddenly became this extreme introvert totally. and was really interested in the life of the mind. And, mm -hmm. and, and so, so I think that together with your having these kind of visual, um, different kinds of visual perceptions, and then really becoming interested in what it was you were seeing, and, and particularly with mathematics and, and geometry, really studying it in a sense, you, so I think it's a combination of actually consciously learning right. things and perhaps some implicit learning along the way, which was maybe released somehow. Yeah, I've definitely, I, I mean, it's definitely gotten better. As, I mean, the more I do it, the, 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 I've definitely learned things from it without question. As, I, as, as I've drawn, you know, literally, you know, thousand drawings probably, I start noticing things that, you know, you wouldn't notice before, like drawing. As I was drawing pi, I just started noticing that prime numbers fell on specific vectors constantly. You know, mm -hmm. but if I hadn't drawn it a bunch of times and been counting it, you know, I would not have noticed that. Um, so, it definitely, some of it I, I would say I learned over over the time. You know, to, it, that made it stronger and, and made me understand it better. Especially going to school. School helped me look at it in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, and then along the way, you you started getting some attention for this this you know ability. And you just, I I mentioned this because I literally just came from the airport from this conference um, uh, in Tucson called the Towards a Science of Consciousness conference. Mm -hmm. And um, I was at one a few years back in Stockholm, which you talk about in your book. Yes. And this was sort of your debut. It was the first time you went on stage. Mm -hmm. You talked about it, and you met with a lot of the world's experts. Yes. Um, so how did that experience change your thinking about what has happened to you? It made me accept it more, you know, that it, that it wasn't, it wasn't, I, for, for a long time, I really doubted myself, you know, until I, I started really getting to talk to people and realize this was something that, that was real, and I thought it was important, but I, always kind of had this doubt that what if everybody else didn't think it was, you know, like what if you're crazy, you know, you always see that one person that's crazy that doesn't know they're crazy, you know, I remember thinking, well, what if that's me, what if I'm that guy that's saying I'm seeing pie everywhere and really I'm not, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> so it was a great relief when I finally was able to write the equation and go say, okay, here we go, this is, this is going to give us the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be a nice study to, to look at, let's say, compare your brain when you're looking at these images or these equations with, let's say, a, you know, a, a mathematician who's, mm -hmm. who's studied it for a long time to see if there's similar kinds yeah. of areas of activation, um, you know, parietal lobe activation, we know that's a lot of where calculations are occurring. But I think that fundamentally you had a, whatever this blow to your head did, it definitely had a, and we know from cases going back to Phineas Gage who had a brain lesion in his prefrontal cortex, completely changed his personality, right. except it was sort of the opposite. He went being, from being very sort of introverted to becoming very kind of extroverted and a bit aggressive. Um, mm -hmm. But you had a combination of this personality change, um, a sort of synesthesia, and a kind of abstract synesthesia where you're, you're seeing... Grid-like. Everything is grid-like. Right. But I guess I'm, I'd, be, I'd be cautious to call it um, an acquired genius, so to speak. You know, I think that that sends the message that, you know, and, I'd, and, 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 and some people might believe this, but I, as far as I know, there's not much evidence for that. We all have like this extraordinarily, you know, genius abilities that are just there latent, you know, and if we just sort of, you know, hit ourselves on the head somehow, we would right. <laughs> yeah. become Yeah, we're gonna these. have a lot of people with head trauma. Yeah, and I, <laughs> you know, I wanna make clear, this is a really um, unique case and it's a combination of different things. And, you know, I just, um, 
you know, it's my sort of science skepticism mm -hmm. here saying, let's just be careful with what we, we call this. And, right. and there, you know, people who are born um, like savants, mm -hmm. a lot of the times have a sort of these amazing skills, but they are picking up patterns over time that they're learning. Even people, you know, these people who can name any date, you know, right. from whatever year, they're actually um, implicit patterns in the calendar years that if you know these certain rules, you know, and it's not that people are, if you study calendars long enough, you can, you, your brain unconsciously picks up these implicit patterns mm -hmm. um, and people can become better and better. Or even extreme memory, um, there, was, there was one person who could, who trained himself to have this extraordinary memory as well. So these things can be learned. That being said, we do have an ex amazing amount, and I've met people who are called superhumans, who had these extraordinary abilities, we have these abilities that are latent there if we really work at them. So I think perhaps in your case, a combination of things was that you became more introverted, you became more interested in these topics, right. in addition to having a unique, perhaps maybe a restructuring of your brain circuitry post the incident right. that gave you these visual illusions and, and you know, together. And together, this, I, yeah. then I focused on it. Once I was focused on it, that's all I thought about. So right. for, not only was I holed up in my house for three years, but for three years I was looking at how everything moved. And since it had this jittery, discrete movement, I started thinking, well, what if I over, because it made it look kind of pixelated. Mm -hmm. So mentally I would overlay like a graph. Uh, and then as I found that if I made the graph sufficiently tiny, I could make all the motions of everything in my visual frame of reference line up with a vertex point on the graph as long as the graph was sufficiently tiny. And later on, of course, I learned that that's what calculus is. We're dividing up things into these little integrals, and the smaller the integrals get, the more closely we are approximating whatever it is that we're trying to define. But to me, it was just amazing realizing that, that I, and I, I started visualizing this as this grid structure of space-time, which of course gets much smaller, but still it made it very obvious that everything was somehow grid-related, which then makes me think, you know, oh, that's what algebra, you know, everything is, everything in math you see done on graphs. And that's the reason I, I believe is because the universe is doing the same thing, just naturally. Mm -hmm. So do you, in a sense, feel like you have this, um unveiling like the language of the universe, like the matrix or something, and all of a sudden you can see the... <laughs> I mean, well, literally is the universe your... is a grid structure, but it's not like... Well, to you, to, in yeah. your mind. Yeah, in, in my opinion, okay. yeah, I should say okay. in my opinion. In your... Yeah, that, that can warp and stretch. But uh, the way I view it, and this is just the way I, I view it, of course, is uh, that it, the universe is like a, a grid structure, and the grid cannot be sliced infinitely small. Like in calculus, they say we slice these intervals and the, the, the width of the interval approaches an infinitely small value. And for me, it all approaches the Planck length or the Planck length. Mm -hmm. So basically we have a grid structure, which is a fractal, where the tiniest we can slice space-time and have it still be relative to us is the Planck length which mm -hmm. is this, this tiny, uh, very, very small distance that Maxwell Planck you know, won the Nobel Prize for discovering his, his constants. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... <laughs> Another thing that it, it's interesting to highlight is we all are seeing the world through our own perspective, right? That's right. being generated by the brain. Right. And things like different kinds of drugs, I mean, different kinds of wiring in the brain. People who are autistic, we know it's more actually, we're beginning to learn that it has to do with more of a different kind of a wiring and per therefore perceiving the world in a different way. And we know from you know, studying or trying to understand the neural basis of consciousness that, that what is actually existing out there in reality isn't necessarily correlated to what we're perceiving in our minds. And our brain plays all sorts of tricks on us all the time. So, one thing we always should be cautious of is, is, to, is to be a little bit distrustful of our own, um, there's certain illusions that we mm -hmm. have, that, you know, of our own, you can't always trust your intuition and, or your perception, because we can mm -hmm. definitely be fooled, and magicians play off this all the time. Yes. Um, so certain drugs that people do change brain chemistry, change brain activation, and cause people to have lots of similar kinds of, you know, visual illusion, seeing things in, in different kinds of colors or, or even kind of synesthetic experiences um, that can happen all the time. So the, it's important to understand that we're perceiving the world that in our brains that's not necessarily correlated to the reality out there. And we should be cautious 
when wanting to jump to conclusions about the nature of reality right. based on our own personal experiences. Right. Um, and always sort of look more towards, I think, and, and I think mathematics. I mean, I've studied math actually originally when I was an undergraduate, and I was like, this is amazing. This is the language of the universe. You know, it just all makes sense, and it almost feels like it's out there, and I'm just sort of discovering it. Um, but I just think, you know, to make grand claims that now I know this is how the universe right. you know, works is, is we need to kind of... Yeah, that's just what yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. That's yeah. Not, that's, I'm not saying that is it. I'm just saying if I were to visualize it, that's how I visualize it. Um, but of course, by definition, the, the Planck length is not even observable. Mm -hmm. So it's all theoretical. So. So, so a day in your life is like what? You're walking around or are you, are you, you know, seeing these images everywhere? Are you, are, I mean, how do you get through a day? It, it's, it's constant, uh, mm -hmm. and I find that, especially at first, it was really hard to get through a day without being distracted. Like, I would find myself stopping and, and counting flower petals and realizing how many of these flower petals were symmetrical and how, how few of them had prime numbers of petals, mm -hmm. although some do. And the, but the ones that did tend to have, like, a leaf that fell out and was kind of, like, off, <laughs> was not symmetrical. So... Um, and then I started looking at the symmetry of light, and of course, then it kind of makes sense when you think about it. Um, or, or I remember one day at, at school, it was pouring rain, and I was late for a class, and I saw this puddle, and raindrops are hitting the puddle, and it's this beautiful interference pattern of these waves rippling over each other, and it just doesn't look like it used to. It's so, it's so grid-like, and the interference pattern is so amazing. And I remember stopping and bending over so the rain wouldn't get on my camera. And I was taking pictures of this puddle. <laughs> and I hear this banging noise. And I looked up, and this entire class was up against the window looking at me, taking pictures of me, <laughs> taking pictures of the puddle. And so I was like, well, it's time for me to scoodle to my trig class, you know. <laughs> so it, 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 I've tried to, to learn how to sometimes hide it. And, and I've gotten better at learning when to not talk about it by looking at people's you know, body language. Because some people really aren't interested and, mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and they don't want to hear about it forever. My, my poor mother has had many phone calls where she has listened to me you know, tell her whatever I was thinking or seeing that night and, or that day. And uh, you know, she was the only one that had to listen. And so <laughs> eventually you know, I started learning to, to look for that. And if I see somebody, you know, their eyes rolling back, then I would try to pull back, but at first it was hard to do. It was just like all I could talk about. And just like having OCD, I had to learn how to, to control it. Um, because again, that's not what everybody wanted to talk about all the time, so. And so, speaking of the OCD, so you, you also, you know, developed this, what you might consider a positive ability or something that was an, a, a unique, interesting experience for you that wasn't unpleasant. Mm -hmm. um, but you also developed OCD, PTSD, um, a bit of depression. Yes. Um, so, so, do you think that those sort of unfortunate consequences of your head trauma, um, as they, do you think they're connected to your ability? And if they can be treated, let's say your OCD, as your OCD is getting better, and you said you've gone for treatment for that. Right. Has that affected um, this other ability? Yeah, I would actually say the OCD in a way did help because it gave me, I mean, for one, I was extremely interested in everything I was seeing, but to draw these drawings, some of them, you can't make any error because it's in pencil and there's thousands of lines on some of them. So if you do make an error or the, or the, the ruler slips, you can't erase it and you have to throw it away and you've lost hours or days of work. Um, and, and to measure these angles and many of these drawings, while they're beautiful, they're just tedious. You know, so if, if you have OCD, it's the perfect thing to do. The same thing over and over and over again. So it, it helped, you know. I drew more at the beginning, actually, than I do now. Yeah, because so. I, I was going to say, as you're, because um, you know, we were talking a bit, and you were saying that it's starting to get a bit better, your OCD, and mm -hmm. I was imagining that because, I mean, and, you know, a lot of academics have a sort of a bit of OCD. You know, you have to be yeah. so focused on these details for hours and hours and hours and, and, and maybe mixed in with a bit of neuroticism. But, um, <laughs> you ha and, but I would think, I often think, you know, if this, you know, this slightly obsessive type of, mm -hmm. of behavior goes away, you know, exactly, you're not going to want to spend so many hours, perhaps, drawing these, these fractal images. So, so, you know, as, I guess this is my question, as your negative 
symptoms are kind of dissipating, are you okay that some of your, because you also get a lot of attention for these, you know, images that you're drawing right. and whatnot, and which could motivate you to maybe want to draw more of them, but that is in conflict with perhaps getting better, you know, psychologically. Right. I, I have drawn less as I've gotten better with the OCD. I'm also, I have an artificial disc in my neck now. And I, if I, in certain positions, I lose all the feeling uh, halfway down my arms from like the ring, or from, I'm sorry, from my middle finger to my pinkies. So it's getting harder to draw too. Um, but, I, but still, I have noticed that I'm doing it less because, whereas before I just absolutely was obsessed with every line, while I still am, it's not as extreme as it was because we went through this desensitizing process uh, where they would have me touch a clean table and then touch my face, which is almost impossible at first, you know, and then slowly progress to different things. You know, I still could never touch a, a dirty doorknob, you know, and touch my face, but at least got to where I could function. I mean, I, I would be, if I went in public, it was literally, I was cringing to, to, if somebody was breathing near me. Uh, when if I had my daughter with me, then it was just 10 times worse because I was, so I would worry about her, and you know, and if she had gone to daycare, then I would really worry about yeah. her because there was all these other kids that were there. So she'd come home and get, boink, she goes in the shower, you know, after daycare. <laughs> and then finally, you know, you can give her a hug, is you know, a real hug. Right. So. Decontamination. Right. Exactly. Right. There was this decontamination <laughs> that must occur after daycare. But I did find what was one of the. It was a good effect, but also an unfortunate effect is that it worked. You know, I have very few colds. I've had like three colds since this happened. <laughs> so it's like that's the wrong message. I know just it's the that. wrong message because that's I'm just, like, yeah, it that could works. Be a completely false correlation. Yep. Just like <laughs> just a coincidence. Yes. <laughs> so, it, so if if we if you could erase this event in history, do you think you you would? I mean, would you? You, you are you? No way. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's too awesome. Um, <laughs> it, it, it's just been. It's been amazing because I, I remember lying awake as a kid, you know, trying to think about the things that we all think. How do we get there? If a tree falls in the forest, does it make a noise if nobody's there to hear it? You know, and these are questions that I thought you could never have an answer to. And suddenly there was a way to, to analyze it and, and get answers, whether all of them are correct or not. Uh, you know, I think they are, but at least get there. And and I can't believe I wasn't interested in it. I mean, I, I was, I just can't believe, it's like having two different lives, you know. I, I have this life before, and, and it was in some ways this blissful ignorance, you know. Like, mm -hmm. I can remember dropping things and picking it up off the floor and eating it. And, you know, <laughs> and not even thinking about it, you know. G going to bars and, and just my buddy handing me his beer and me taking a drink out of his beer, which is just the thought now. Just, <laughs> oh. Especially in some of those bars in Alaska, so. But uh, but anyway, yeah, it, it's it's been different. It opens up. I mean, I think for, for, you know, understanding mathematics and 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 the way it works is a beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to be aware of, and mm -hmm. it's almost like I'm thinking again about the Matrix. You know, you can take the blue pill and be in this blissful ignorance, or you could take the red pill and That's see. That's a good some, way to think yeah, about it. Yeah, painful truth of reality sometimes. Yeah. But but I think that. May, you know, the good thing is that you became more interested in these things. It opened up this world to you, and mm -hmm. it gave you a sort of a narrative to explain the, your place here or, or how you see your place in the universe or how it's all working that really gave you a sense of satisfaction Yes. or answered some of these questions that, that, that you... It answered, for me, it answered right. a lot of big questions, you know, because I'm all, I love just sitting here and thinking, you know, how did we get here? You know, how do you get something from nothing? And, uh, you know, how do you get a Big Bang? How would you create a Big Bang, you know? And, and how does the supernova work? You know, all of these different things. And, they're, and Or what is relativity? And how do you explain it in a simple way? Or how do you draw it? And I found that there were ways that you could explain a lot of these things in a drawing. And it made sense. And it worked for me. And it was technically pretty close, you know, to being right. If you want to get real technical, mm -hmm. there's a couple little things that you would change. But overall, the principle was correct. And, uh, and I found that it worked for me, since I had to say it in layman terms, and it worked for everybody that I would show it to, and they would all get excited. People would come in and say they hate math, and two minutes later, they were like, I know, where I know the, uh, the basic idea of relativity, mm -hmm. which is something that they would just brush over you know, instantly, thinking there's just no way I can understand it. And every person who I explain it to, they all get it.
because mm. but they have to have this drawing and you have to ask the right questions. It almost sounds to me sort of, well, sort of the title of your book is Struck by Genius, but it's almost like you were struck by curiosity. It was like something awakened in your mind that yeah. really became curious about these things mm -hmm. to explore further. And, and then you started, in conjunction with seeing these visual patterns as well, which might have... That definitely made the intro, I mean, it was like, it's like a new world. Mm -hmm. and, and you can't help but be in awe of it because it's just, it, it is beautiful. And, and like just, the, just when I draw a pie, I mean, that by itself, it's just beautiful. It's symmetric, and, and, and there's this beauty and symmetry. In fact, most of us find a beauty as symmetry. Like, if, if we look at somebody and one eye is down here versus up here, then they tend, that tends to, like, say, be not as attractive. And if you split somebody down the middle, you know, the more symmetric they are, typically the more beautiful people say they are. Well, evolutionarily speaking, actually, the reason one of the reasons that people find symmetry so beautiful is that it's a, it's a cue to a good genetic uh, makeup. Right. Right. So the more symmetry, the better sort of genes you have, and the, therefore more attractive, and people want to mate with you. And, right. And yeah. you have a better so, chance of your offspring, yeah. offspring surviving. Exactly. Exactly. So, so I think that, you know, seeing, seeing these patterns <laughs> gave you an emotional satisfaction. Something I'm sort of thinking of just offhand, again, trying to think about bringing it to the neural level and circuitry is that parts of your brain that have to do with, with abstract thinking and mental rotation and mathematical ability and parietal cortices, you know, it could, there are connections to places like the amygdala which have to do with emotion and, and, and finding beauty in, in mathematics, you know, that seems to be like this, this is really a strong link for you and, and it's mm -hmm. a sort of aesthetically pleasing and satisfying. Very, yes. And, and maybe, you know, again, with, with, with head trauma, there's always some sorts of compensation, there's neuroplasticity we know in the brain, and, and you know, not a huge amount of, you, you can't, you know, you're not going to, you know, when people talk about rewiring and things, it's not that you're going to completely rearrange the way the brain is, right. but what could happen is that when you have certain areas of damage, other connections that might have been there before might become strengthened as a way to compensate for wherever the, the sort of, you know, Damages problem are. is, wherever the problem area is, and it seems to me that because there was no sort of, um, overt lesion that came up on MRI, mm -hmm. that it's more likely in your case to be some sort of microstructural lesion in the connectivity in the white matter structure, which is a very common for brain injury. Um, traumatic brain injury, when you get your head hit, it, your, it, your brain is a soft tissue in, in this rigid skull. There's a bunch of ridges at the bottom, and you, know, you can imagine when it's getting shaken inside of it, there's this shearing effect that these white matter connections can be damaged. So in, in your case, if there was some damage to some certain areas of that um, that were no, the connections aren't, say, working as well. Right. Other connections that were there previously might become strengthened, and therefore people can develop, let's say, more um, musical appreciation and then ability, um, or in your case, mathematical or artistic ability. Mm -hmm. um, and yes. so it seems that that, but that emotional element, the fact that there's this connection between these limbic structures that have to do right. with aesthetically pleasing things. And this reward things. that comes with it, too, is like very satisfying also. So it's like, you know, the mouse going through the maze and he gets a reward at the end. I'm getting this reward every time I draw all these drawings. Yeah. And so I, I do get this great feeling from it, too. So it's very rewarding it's also. It's like a hit of helps dopamine. Me. Yeah. Exactly. But what's also interesting, though, is the part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which is, again, a subcortical structure, a little evolutionary older part of the brain. Um, we know that that's involved with obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, but the part of the basal ganglia is the nucleus accumbens, which is also the reward center of the brain, which sort of gets this hit of dopamine when people win money or, or have food when they're, they're food deprived or water if they're thirsty. It's this sort of very rewarding pleasure center of the brain, but it's also linked to OCD. And when we have some patients who are treatment resistant, who nothing has worked, um, where they actually go in and get what's called deep brain stimulation, um, they plant electrodes to stimulate that very part of the brain, the nucleus accumbens within the basal ganglia. So that, you know, it, it is interconnected, this, this sort of OCD symptomology, but also in the same area of the brain that has to do with reward processing. Mm -hmm. So. You know, this seem, you seem very, something might be going on with your basal ganglia and so. I can understand <laughs> that, because too, like when, when, uh, when, when I would do something like that, that was obsessive compulsive, it, and I would try not to do it, it was, I would feel just this, this yucky feeling, and, and I would, could not do anything but think about that. And then finally when I did, like whatever, like wash my hands, or think a certain, certain thought to try to, you know, eliminate whatever it was that I was thinking about, you do get this feeling of, whew, 
you know, this relief, and that relief is some sort of, you know, pleasure response, or at least lack of, the lack of the anxiety mm -hmm. is a good thing, because OCD is just constant anxiety, because there's, there's too much to worry about, and you start noticing everything, and if you look closely enough, you can find something wrong with everything, mm -hmm. and, and there's no way to deal with it, so. And it's over, you and just it's become overwhelming. overwhelming, and you yeah. wind up being in a house with rugs over the window. Right. <laughs> and that's why part of the treatment for OCD actually is to what you were talking about, this desensitization therapy, where it, it's called exposure response prevention. Mm -hmm. So you expose somebody to like lesser forms of the thing that they're afraid of, so whatever they can tolerate little by little, and have them sit with that anxiety and, and show them that nothing bad is going to happen. Because it's a lot of this cognitive fear of, oh, if I touch this now, I'm going to get some horrible disease. But you sort of have the person touch it, touch your face, see you don't get a disease, and then over time, you know, that anxiety becomes less and less or more tolerable, and you, right. you realize that, you know, some of the cognitive things that you're thinking that, oh, I'm gonna get a horrible disease kind of melt away. But other research actually we're doing now with contamination type OCD, we're looking at primary sensory processing. So we're looking at olfaction and people smelling different smells while they're in the scanner. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that people with contamination type OCD actually have, are hypersensitive to not just disgusting images, but disgusting odors as well. I, I always smell things, I, it's weird, my wife and I, I will open the refrigerator and I'm like, something's bad in there and she won't notice it and then two days later she notices it. And mm -hmm. so I always smell it first and now she just believes me because, we, <laughs> yeah, but we were talking about that, wondering if there was a different amount of receptors in the nose or... No, what? What it, well, what we're finding is that there's a part of the brain called the insula, which has to do with disgust processing. It also has to do with your sense of um, feeling of your internal feelings, like sort of your, your body awareness. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why people, when you, people say disgust is such a visceral kind of feeling. Right. You know? and, and, and evolutionarily speaking, to be disgusted is very important mm -hmm. to yes. you know, avoid poison. And um, so, so it's a very primal um, feeling. But so with OCD um, patients, their insula, uh, lights up much more than people than healthy controls to disgusting odors compared to pleasant odors. So there's this hypersensitivity to disgust, and one idea here is that it's not. It's actually might start out as a primary sensory processing problem where everything just feels hyper disgusting. You know, the doorknob just feels really disgusting, and then over time becomes the more cognitive fear, the learned. You know, I'm going to learn to avoid that now because right. I don't want that disgusting feeling. Um, so it's more of a disgust circuitry rather than a. a Thought of amygdala, kind of emotional anxiety circuitry. Like this disgust circuitry, circuitry creates this like conditioned response towards just you know. Avoid, avoid. It's almost towards. like if you think about it in another sensory modality, if somebody's very sensitive to sound, so something you know to one person might be fine, but to another person it would sound like it's blasting in their ears. They're mm -hmm. going to avoid that sound, right? And over time, that becomes a, a pattern of behavior that needs to be right. broken. So that's sort of some so. Sensory processing, you're having sensory processing sort of, I wouldn't call it deficits, but um, differences right. we know already in your visual realm. So it, would, it could also be that you're having sensory differences in your olfactory realm as well, and maybe auditory as well, you know. Uh, the, one thing I have, the only thing that I've noticed auditory is that uh, if I'm surprised or if I'm trying to sleep and I hear a noise, even just like a door closing in the house, not even loudly, I see a little flash of light. Don't know hmm. why, uh, but it, and I jump mm -hmm. a little bit. I'm like, I'm, it seems like even though I'm relaxed, I have this hypertension, and it's always accompanied with this little poof of, of, of light. Yeah, uh, and I don't know why. Although my wife uh, now she's she's six months pregnant. We're having a baby, and exactly a hundred. Well, the due date is a hundred days from today, <laughs> and uh, her nose has now become more hypersensitive than mine. So yeah. she can smell anything, anywhere. I have to eat next to a window with a fan now. So, <laughs> so. No, it's true. Yeah. I, and I, and, and that I, evolutionarily, yeah. that's a good thing. Yeah. I, I was just saying that I just, um, I have a five month old daughter now and I, you know, so I was pregnant and I all of a sudden got this hypersensitive, I mean, walking around New York and every used to bother me. Now I'm like, oh, this is, I mean, so many smells and the <laughs> dog pee everywhere. I could smell everything. Yeah. So. You know, it's just another way of showing, though, that you know your 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 senses are can 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 change, yeah. right? Based on your brain chemistry um, and, and neuroanatomy. So everybody, although you know we, I, I know I know I'm conscious. I think you're conscious, and you might have a similar type of consciousness as, as I do. But our senses can be can be very different. Mm -hmm. um, they're 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 malleable, and they can change over time, and they can change with drugs. And and when your sensory processing changes, so the way we're taking in and, and experiencing the world changes, your cognition, you know, how we're interpreting 
all the sensations can change as well, right. um, which is basically more you know, different parts of the cortex. As sensation changes, perception and, and cognition can change as well. And, and that sort of seems as well what has happened with you. It's a sort of cacophony of different, you know, and sounds intermixing with lights and, and all these different sensory, new sensory experiences. You had to kind of make sense of them in a way. Right. And, and that affected your, the way you think about the world and interpret the world. Right. You know, so it is all relative. But my perception of the world is different than yours, and you know our brains are. are there's a very there's commonality, of course, right. but there are also there are, there are definitely differences that that you know change our, our views and how we interact with the world. Mm -hmm. Um, so like when you hear a car or a motorcycle drive by you real quickly, it goes and it changes pitch. And that's because short wavelengths we hear as a high pitch and long wavelengths we hear as a low pitch. So as the car's coming towards me, that sound wave leaves it and it kind of gets squished together. So we hear that high pitch and then whoom, it goes by me. And now that it's moving away, that wavelength stretches out, gets longer and we hear a low pitch. But then you add relativity to it and say, for instance, the car's moving from me towards you. Well, relative to my position, as it's moving away from me, the wavelengths are stretching out, so I hear a lower pitch. But relative to your position, it's moving towards you. You hear a higher pitch. The person in the car traveling with the wave hears no compression, so they hear a medium pitch. And then you stop right there and say, well, what sound is the car making? A low pitch, <laughs> a medium pitch, or a high pitch? And what's so weird is it's making all three relative to who's looking at it. And then, then you say, which reality is the real one? Mm -hmm. All three are real, but relative. And in the net, the final step is saying, now imagine we have an infinite number of people all looking at that same car. Every person is moving at a different velocity from not moving to the speed of light. Every one of them hears a different sound and every reality is real, but relative. Wow. And, and, and everything is affected by the Doppler effect. It's just we notice sound because it's so slow, but light has the Doppler effect. So if I, blue is a short wavelength, you know, and red is a longer wavelength. So if you had a twin and your twin and I shot away from you guys at the speed, close to the speed of light, you would see my shirt go through the rainbow from blue to red, whereas your twin in motion with me would still see my shirt as blue. So then you say, what color is my shirt? It actually is every color if you had people moving at all different velocities looking at me. So everything is just this wave that is interpreted as color or sound, but really it can be interpreted as anything and it really is that relative to those observers. And that's the kind of stuff that I just love thinking about because yeah, it's just, I, it's funny, in, I, as working at my, my dad's futon and, and mattress store off and on, I would I have the drawings all over the walls, and I would bring a person would walk in the store, and I think of any reason at all to bring up math or physics, <laughs> yeah. uh, just to get the conversation going, and uh, and I found that like 90% of them enjoy it, and and I've had I have a lot of people that come back and say, especially like talking to you about relativity. Um, they come back and say, you know, I thought about that, and you're right, you know, it's, it's so, that world really does work that way, and it changes my view. And, and even the ones that start off where they're like, oh, geez, math, please don't talk about it. And I'm like, just give me one second, and if you're not interested, then, well, you know, we'll go sell you a mattress. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and then they start getting into it when they realize that they can understand it. When I show them this series of pictures and show how it works, and they all are, I've had, even when I get students that come in that are in calculus and they're trying to learn derivatives and I show them this way to, to understand derivatives of two pieces of light moving relative to each other. And it's very simple and can be explained to anybody. Whereas when you try to understand derivatives uh, just traditionally, it can be very difficult to grasp and take a long time. It took me a long time to grasp it until I finally visualized derivatives as two beams of light moving through space at two different directions relative to each other. And, uh, but I found that most people were interested and I would try to take it to the level where it seemed like, okay, they didn't, couldn't go past that or didn't want to go past that and then I would stop. But the overall reception was really good. In fact, we sold a lot of futons and mattresses, <laughs> you know, because of it. People would get done and say, wow, I have no relativity, and now I have to buy a futon. You know? <laughs>
Now, I've gone through all of calculus and I'm into linear algebra, but I haven't, I'm, when it comes to traditional training, I'm probably the equivalent of a sophomore or a junior. So there's so much that I don't know that I still need to learn. Um, I like to think of everything relativistically, I like you know, this relative to that, um, but there's, there's a lot that I have left to learn. When I try to think about the nature of reality, um, the, the really the, the farthest I've been able to take it is, is the structure of space-time, you know, being this Planck structure, um, possibly, uh, possibly the grid being from the, you know, Planck lengths being from black holes, possibly Hawking radiation uh, being emitted from these Planck length black holes, which helps us to give, get this grid. Uh, and I try to think of all sorts of thought experiments, like Einstein uh, and his light clock, where he would uh, bounce a photon between two mirrors and show how these, this photon is bouncing up and down between two mirrors, and it says it's one foot up and one foot down. So this photon has now traveled one foot. But when you put that uh, light clock in motion, now it's bouncing up and down, but it's also moving this direction, so it's traveling further through space. And as I visualize space-time, I'm visualizing it as whole multiples of Planck lengths and, uh, and visualizing like Planck time also. Planck time is how long it travel or how, how long, excuse me, how long it takes a photon to travel one length, Planck length. And I found the same thing, that if I alter the angle that I travel, then for me to go to point A to point B, if I go at this angle, it takes me two Planck lengths to get there, which would be like two Planck time at the speed of light. But if I travel at a different angle, I have to go through, because you can't travel fractions of Planck lengths whatsoever. So if I travel at a different angle, I travel eight <laughs> Planck lengths, which means time, yeah, there's more time for me to get there. So basically, the straighter that you go, or the faster that you go, uh, the slower time goes which is what he is saying, but that's the closest I can get to, to wrapping my brain around it in the way that I think, but it, it seems to agree with it. But, uh, but again, I, I have a lot to learn about it. I did see a lot of squaring of circles and a, a lot of uh, one to two ratios because we, we find those ratios pleasant. And I also think, again, because the universe is made, in my opinion, the universe is discrete and made of whole multiples of the Planck, Planck length. So like when we hear music, it's like a, a wave <laughs> length. If we hear, you hear somebody playing music and suddenly you hear that note that goes and it's just wrong, that's like one compared to two and a half. You know, it's if one length compared to two, we find these ratios pleasant. And I noticed that in a lot of the drawings where it would go up, say, two inches, but the square, there would be a square that came out right at one. So we would still have these one to two ratios. And then I noticed the beginning of squaring of a circle in several of them. So you would have a square with a circle, I'm sorry, sorry, a circle with a square, and then another one rotated 45 degrees. And if you keep doing that, you're literally squaring a circle, which is building pi. And so a lot of people, once they see the, the way that mm -hmm. squares and circles work together, find these similar connections. So I, I saw a lot of similarities in the drawings that I was looking at. I mean, the thing that's fascinating here, and I think that where most people are resonating is, is this unique way in which he sees the world, which is a rare phenomenon. And, but what, what helped me in terms of to help other people, because this isn't an everyday event, right? So if we're talking about treating patients or people that I see, the thing that would really help me is understanding really how this is linked to the underlying, your, your, the neural basis of this phenomena, how you're seeing things. And, and it's not, as I said, the, the, seeing the world in these kinds of patterns is not that far-fetched because as you can see in this art that's gone on for, you know, whatever, thousands of years, people have been visualizing um, things in this way. Mm -hmm. So it, there is something way in which our visual system works, as I said, you know, the way it's organized that, that makes us amenable to these kinds of visions. I mean, you're not seeing, I don't know, stars everywhere, right? There's right. this very particular, um, and, and I think that's tied to the way we perceive the world. But if I could understand more about, and I mean, it would be great to do more tests with you, because as far as I know, there's just this one imaging study that was done yep. um, where they just showed you the images in the scanner and just saw yeah. sort of what lit up. Um, they did that and then they did transcranial magnetic, magnetic stimulation. stimulation to, to, do you know to what part of your brain? A you bunch of it. I remember that it was too strong at first. It was, I mean, it was moving my arms when they were zapping me with it. Uh, so, it, but it's on YouTube. They have oh, a yeah? video on YouTube. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 
Unfortunately, it doesn't turn off. Um, I'm learning to try to control it a little bit better, but I'm constantly, like, even when I'm driving, I'm watching the car in front of me, and, I, and, I'm, and I, I'm literally picturing, like, here's, the road is turning like this, and I am visualizing a secant line on the inside of it and a tangent line on the outside, and as they approach closer and closer, I'm approaching the true value of that curve and I want my derivative to equal zero relative to it, you know, so that I'm turning at the same rate. Or looking at the car in front of me and saying, it's 10 feet in front of me now, and now one second later, it's 11 feet in front of me. So if I take that 10 feet and subtract that 11 feet, then that one feet is the acceleration that, it, that it's, is occurring, you know, and, and I just can't stop thinking about it because it's just fascinating. But you're able to still drive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although my daughter has joked on the news too about that, saying that uh, many times she said, "Dad, stop," because I was looking at fractals in the trees or focused on something where I really should have been focused on stopping. That the car in front of me was accelerating, you know. And acceleration doesn't mean go faster; just go faster. It means also changing your velocity, going slower. And so the car in front of me is stopping, and I'm focusing on something else. And luckily. She's back there saying, hey, hit the brake. <laughs> Relativistically, we're going to be mush if you don't hit the brake. So.